We're all in this together. That was the unifying message back in spring 2020. But to what degree did that actually turn out to be true? The ONS reports that COVID-19 mortality for people of Black African or Black Caribbean ethnicity in the first half of 2020 was two to two and a half times higher than for people of white ethnicity. Meanwhile, while many white collar employees have been able to transition to home working, many workers in manufacturing, caring, leisure and services have not had that option and in too many cases have sadly died as a result. The COVID-19 pandemic has created, or perhaps just revealed, true stark inequalities in health and social care in the UK. In today's session, we will ask why this has been the case, which groups have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic, and what lessons have been learned about how we might eliminate inequity in health and social care in the future. Hello, and welcome to Are We Really In This Together? Tackling Inequalities in Health and Social Care, which is part of the National Day of Reflection. My name is Sam Royston. I'm Director of Research and Policy at Marie Curie, and I'm delighted to be joined by an absolutely outstanding panel to discuss these crucial areas. Carol Cooper began a career in nursing over 30 years ago, but found her origins as a Jamaican woman born in the UK meant that she continued to observe and experience systemic exclusion, which threatened to limit, erase and silence people who looked like her. She is now an award-winning leader specialising in equitable leadership and racial, on, uh, and racial trauma. Vic Rayner is Executive Director of the National Care Forum, in this role, she chairs the government's strategic advisory forum on the social care workforce and is co-chair of the National Social Care Advisory Group on Social Care and Technology. She also sits on a range of government and national specialist groups which focus on the social care workforce, digital transformation and new models of care. Patrick Vernon OBE is a social commentator, campaigner and cultural historian with over 20 years of experience working across mental health, public health, heritage and race equality. In 2018, Patrick kick-started the campaign for an amnesty for the Windrush generation. Patrick is currently Associate Director for Com Connected Communities at the Centre for Ageing Better, Equality and Diversity Advisor to Lambeth Council, Chair of Citizens Partnership for Healthcare Safety Investigation Branch and Senior Associate at Olmec. Welcome, Carol, Vic, Patrick, thank you so much for joining us. So first kind of opening question for each of you. We know that the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has disproportionately affected some groups of people. Why do you think this has been and what could be done to prevent this happening again? Perhaps I could come to Carol first on that. Uh, thank you very much for that, Sam. Um, disproportionate impact has been the um, experience of BME people in the UK, I think, since we've been here. Um, and so I feel that the um, COVID um, pandemic has only opened up something that's already been there. Um, but many people didn't notice, many people didn't see, many people didn't experience that. And so all it has done is, is, is created this big reveal of the diversity of experiences that exists in the UK um, that many people have been walking alongside but has never noticed. So revealing inequalities in experience. And do you have any reflections on what could be done to prevent this happening again in the future? Because that difference, it has been brought out really, really starkly during the course of the last year. Inequalities in society create inequalities in health. And when we're not addressing the social determinants of ill health, we're really not trying to address the problem. For me, racism is a public health problem. It's not been accepted as such. I think in the UK, we have a very a kind of uh, dishonest relationship with race racism and our history and the impact that it currently has um, in society and until we can get to the place where we are prepared to have that very honest discourse about racism as a very real determinant 
of health in the UK, then I don't think things will ever change. I think the reporting of um, the unequal impact, the inquiry, the way that was managed kind of reinforced that there is a, a high level of sensitivity, volatility, and uh, around the subject of racism, that level of discomfort is not going to help us to look at um, the very real impact and to try and eradicate that in a way that will bring equity for all in the UK. Thanks, Carol. I wonder if I could come to you, Vic, next. Um, what, what are your reflections on um, what, 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 uh, the, what, which groups have been particularly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic? And again, those thoughts on, is there anything that we could do to prevent this happening again in the future? Thanks, Sam. Um, uh, well, uh, let's, I think, I mean, obviously having these kind of discussions hopefully will be a start to thinking about what can, what we can learn from it. I mean, I, I come, uh, I work within the care sector. Uh, so our organisation supports not-for-profit care providers and um, many of those organisations provide uh, care homes uh, and um, for both for working age adults, um, people with learning disabilities and physical disabilities and for older people. And I mean, it's not, you know, it's not uh, in, in that sense, a sort of reveal in the same way as Carol was talking about in, in terms of the impact that COVID has had on that group of people. But I think what has been really revealing in the context of the pandemic is just how invisible those parts of the population were. And, and I think it's, it's fascinating and depressing in equal measures that even on today, this day of reflection, when the, the figures that are cited uh, about the number of people who had died at this time last year only reflect the number of people who died within the hospital system mm. and had access to a testing regime that enabled us to know that they um, had very sadly died from COVID-19. And there were groups of people within care home settings, older people generally within care home settings at that time who had died uh, and and we we didn't have the testing, we didn't have the support, and we weren't collecting the information about them. Um, that means that you know even on this very important day, we're not able to honour and recognise um, them in the same ways that that we are others. And as time has gone on, I think we've also begun to really recognise um, uh, just how many people with learning disabilities, particularly, have been affected by. COVID-19 and just how invisible they were in terms of the support that was offered to those organisations, often that weren't, might be care homes, but might be people living independently in the community or within supported living systems. And we're only just now putting together the right level of support um, around testing um, and uh, vaccination, for example, for that cohort of people. So I think, uh, you know, I'd echo Carol's comments in relation to health inequities that that already existed, and some of them, some of the, and and cultural kind of inequ or cultural attitudes towards groups of people that COVID nineteen uh, highlighted, um, and very sadly uh, meant that the access to services, the access to the right level of support, um, wasn't certainly available at the beginning of the pandemic for those groups, and and I would argue that. The position that people are in now and i'm thinking particularly of people living within care homes where they are still very limited in terms of their ability to connect and communicate and have visits and engage with people that they want that there's still a a, a level of um exclusion and invisibility applied to that group uh, even a year on from the beginning of the pandemic that's a really interesting term that you used again and again there, Vic, um, invisibility. This isn't just about people not receiving the same level of care or service, it's about people being invisible. Why do you think we've allowed as a society some groups of people to be invisible through the course of this pandemic? I mean, I think that, that certainly one of the, um, you know, very early things we identified and, and, and learned was that we weren't, that if it wasn't, if people weren't being counted or if we didn't have the data available, then action was very limited. 
so, you know, one of the early things that we were able to do as an organization working with members was to raise the profile of the number of people who were very sadly dying within care homes and yet not appearing in those daily statistics that we all got very sadly used to hearing. So I think there was there's definitely something about, you know, it's a bit trite, but you know, you treasure what you measure in, in a sense. So there's definitely something about, you know, making sure that the metrics that we have recognize all parts of society and all parts of the community. But I, I mean, I think the other things are that, that you know, this certainly people with learning disabilities um, have been a very invisible population, mm. you know, for many years, uh, a population of people who spent a long time in uh, institutions and, and outside of our view. And I don't think we have done as much as we might imagine we've done to make that group of people more visible, more integrated, more part of society. And I, and I think it was really, it was just really very sad to see how quickly uh, with the introduction of a pandemic, you talked about lots of, um, you know, white collar workers being able to move their jobs into, um, you know, working at home environment. If you were somebody who was uh, operating and, and working within a supported employment uh, environment, none of those opportunities were available. So people with learning disabilities were almost immediately excluded from almost all workplaces. So, you know, I, th I, I think there's, there's lots in there, um, but uh, and I'm happy to continue the discussion. Thank you. And Patrick, maybe I could come to you on that. Again, what, why do you think that some groups have been so disproportionately affected? And, um, and, and, and in particular, is there any reflections that you have on, is there anything that we could do in the future to, to improve things, to address health inequity? Yeah, I think Carol and uh, Fix explains some of the key groups. Behind me is a portrait uh, done by a good friend of mine, Hayley Bormott from The Guardian. Um, it's an image of all the frontline BME workers who have died in the last 10 months linked to COVID, working frontline workers, doctors, nurses, auxiliaries, support workers, working in healthcare, retail and transport. And at the time, almost a year ago, when we, was, when we were trying to get our head around this issue, what was quite clear that a lot of the staff particularly frontline staff, because of the way that the workforce is, the nature of the workforce, the types of jobs that they were allowed to do, didn't have the right PPE, didn't have the right support. And some in situations, some staff were reassigned to COVID wards, despite the fact that some of them may have had some long-term conditions regarding their health and well-being. And when we started to see all the new media stories, one by one, of frontline workers, mainly Black, Asian, minority ethnic doctors, and particularly the Filipino community, they were hit heavily disproportionately affected too. Um, and despite the, what Matt Hancock said, um, we are in this together and COVID does not discriminate. The impact of COVID does discriminate. And as Carol said, it's for reinforced current inequalities. I remember 20 years ago, I was in charge of a programme for the NHS called Health Action Zone. There are 26 health action zones around the country attacking health inequalities in the most deprived neighbourhoods. Big issues around cancer, diabetes, stroke, stuff around smoking sensation, stuff around fuel poverty, etc. And all COVID's done is just exas exacerbated those health inequalities, which normally would take um, over decades, as happened in weeks, if not days, for some people. Um, our, Ironically, the front, people didn't really value frontline workers until until we had a pandemic. Then obviously someone had a bright idea of doing every Thursday for, was it lasted for about seven months, Thursday evening at uh, eight o'clock, where people would say thank you to the NHS. Then later on it was like thank you to care workers in care homes. And then later on it was like thank you to people working in transport. But frontline workers were invisible to us. Beaming frontline workers are completely invisible until they started dropping like flies all around us and then stories of of their families or media uh, explaining what happened to them in many ways and so even though you know so and it raises major issues i can remember a time um when um nss england the part to help decide to have the nightingale hospitals 
I actually campaigned that why couldn't one of them be named after Mary Seacole, the black Crimean war nurse who was voted Greatest Black Britain over 17 years ago. Uh, and it, it took about three months for the, for the pain to drop to recognise that inclusion, diversity in frontline workers, where they work in care homes, in the NHS, in retail, is quite important if you want to have an inclusive society. And this all happened then at around the time Black Lives Matter, which further raised the whole issue around, particularly for the black community in Britain, uh, structural racism uh, as well. So there's lots of factors that we can explore around this. But also there's been this, uh, and I've had an interesting conversation with Vic about this, there's this, been this polarisation debate around the, part, the intergenerational stuff where everyone's focused on young people and quite rightly about the impact on lockdown on their mental health and well-being. We know that in terms of not doing normal things that we normally do, going to school, seeing their friends, socialising. But also we've not really talked about the issues of the lockdown on older people. I work at the Centre for Aging Better. We've been doing a lot of research work over the last seven months and working with a whole range of research organisations, uh, as well as looking at what's happening around the country. And the, and the impact of lockdown is having a massive impact on people in their 50s and 60s. Particularly, they're more vulnerable to lose their jobs, uh, more likely to be furloughed, uh, and more likely to have impacts on health and well-being. So, in many ways, this is a national conversation that we have. Yes, it's using today as a day of reflection of all the hundreds of thousands of people who have died, but also it's an opportunity for us to have a better society, a better Britain, uh, to make sure that issues around discrimination, inequality, is tackled properly with clear leadership and direction. Thanks, Patrick. That's, uh, that's, uh, there's a, a really important point there that you, that you made and that I think Carol made earlier about um, many of these issues being related to long-term systemic issues uh, of racism within society uh, and other forms of discrimination within society. There's a follow-on question, and maybe I could come to you again, Carol, on this. Is this simply a continuation of problems that have always existed in society as far back as we can remember? Or is there anything new, anything distinct about the experiences of the pandemic which need addressing in a different way? I think it was the um, ferocity of the pandemic that has really almost ignited all of the inequalities across society and put them centre and front of this debate. Um, the mark of a civilised society is how it treats its most vulnerable people. And clearly as a society, there are challenges to the way that we have deliberately um, sought to protect, um, provide for, and bring into an area of visibility those amongst us who are currently invisible Sorry, Carol, we're, we're losing you a little bit on that, but I think that got very much the, uh, the, the, the point of the kind of the, um, the ferocity of the impact of this. I, I, I wonder if I could... Uh, so I, I think that would be around um, the NHS was born out of a recognition. Thanks, Carol. I, I wonder if I could kind of go to uh, go to Vic on this. To, to what degree do you think these uh, the impacts of, of the pandemic that we're seeing today are re the result of um, these long term systemic uh, inequalities? And is there anything new that needs addressing here? Um, I think, Sam, I, I, I mean, I think it's pro there's probably a combination of but both highlighting the things that we already knew were there but but also i think really what we've got to be really careful about is is that what the pandemic i think has the risk of doing is is resetting mm. the dial in a way that disadvantage continue you know almost um justifies discrimination and i'm particularly thinking about that in the context of i mentioned a little bit earlier about visiting and uh, access for older people uh, and and for working age adults with learning disabilities in terms of re re engagement and connection with community. So we've kind of we've taken that tag of vulnerability and I, and I agree, Carol. You know, we we will use that as a lens to look back over 
the pandemic and see where where it is but we've we've then sort of grouped people into into pockets of vulnerability and then said because of that you know the state knows best about how to yeah. keep you in place and keep you away from other people and and I and I think there's some really worrying potential sort of reinforcements of um stereotypes or or you know suddenly we we talk about older people as vulnerable whereas in fact you know there are older people are as mixed and different and diverse as any other group of people so to sort of to to kind of create a label that says you know we're doing this to protect older people or we're doing you know is is probably going to be really unhelpful if we let that sustain as a legacy of of covid in a way and, and i think the other thing it's um so i sit on a board of an organization called hestia a fantastic london um, charity that works across homelessness and um uh, modern slavery projects and you know all sorts of different areas of work and, and a lot of their work is around domestic violence and i think we're just now understanding you know how much covid has kind of re enabled uh, us domestic violence and and violence against women to become less visible as well and and you know that for people to have the kind of support mechanisms cut off because um they they would they couldn't access them physically so i think i think there's a there's there's some stuff that was always there and and covid has kind of reinforced that there's also a risk that we lose some of the progress that has been made mm. Uh, for different groups uh, and I think we're all going to be to be really careful um, that we when we think about what the new normal looks like we don't allow that to reinforce um, inequalities and, and, and discrimination going forward. That's a, a really helpful segue to the next question actually which is about the extent to which uh, inequities in experience through the course of the pandemic will have a long-term impact on society and if I'm hearing you right Carol, uh, sorry Vic, um, I, I, I'm, I think you're suggesting that one of the risks there might be that um, we forget the learning from before the pandemic. We see this as a, as a new page and we start to stereotype in a way which is uh, which is deeply unhelpful. Is 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 that is that a, that a fair summary of, of what you're trying to the, the point that you're making around that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think it's just that idea that you know we we had uh, yes we don't we don't allow our new normal to become more yeah. more fragmented and segmented and and uh, and and you know and kind of cut people off in the name of safety. Uh, and Patrick, maybe I could come to you on that question. To what degree do you think that experiences of uh, inequity through the course of the pandemic will have that long-term impact on society? I think it's going to have a, a number of major impacts on society. So the first one, which we've talked a lot about over the last seven months, is our mental health. Um, particularly for all ages, not just for young people, but for everyone. In terms of the impact of grief and loss, you know, you know, hundreds of thousands of families have lost family members, people have lost work colleagues, friends and neighbours, and that's a, had a disproportionate impact on, particularly on black and minority communities. It's had a massive impact on the care sector, which is, I know that it's been working hard to lobby to, in terms of what the government can do, um, um, and so the impact, particularly on, on the black and minority communities. For someone who's gone through the mental health system of the last 20, 30 years, who's had experience of seclusion, sectioning, and of and being isolated, that's we've had a little taste of that as a population in Britain over the last seven months around the, around lockdown. And I think hopefully people might appreciate more about having better mental health services, uh, not just simply simply improving the current offer around the NHS, but also having all of us taking. A responsibility in our mental health well-being as well so i think the mental health conversation is going to be important we're going for, there's a the, 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 we're going for the review of the mental health act which might be useful but the, it, i think the mental health issue is going to be major i think it needs major investment i think mental health has always been in a poor relation to physical health uh, and i think hopefully that will change also it's been estimated over one million people will have long-term conditions connected with having COVID. 
So there's going to, be, which means that um, you know we already have long-term conditions around diabetes and stroke, coronary heart disease, cancer. Now this is another morbidity, which will have an impact on people's future life expectancy and, and mortality. So again, there's issues around that. Um, I think I think the whole issue around learning disabilities, Dick's t- 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 touched on, is very important. Uh, you know, because again, there's you know, there's an issue around life expectancy and people learn, learn disabilities around COVID as well. So that it, so it's about having more resources and support. And I think the final thing, it, 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 there's an issue about how we live. Housing is a major issue. Uh, uh, there's been a strong correlation between overcrowding and lack of space, green space, uh, and the built environment of COVID, basically. Um, so I think this is, you know, we need a we need a public health revolution. In if not my honest opinion, sadly, over the last 10, 11 years, there've been massive cuts in public health funding. We've lost over a billion pounds in cuts from public health funding, and we have to recognise the impact of austerity, which meant has meant that we haven't had the same kind of structures and systems in place that could have responded more quicker to the pandemic. I think we've done as much as we can, but. You know, if we, if as a nation that we, if, if, if we as taxpayers are willing to pay extra funding, either in our taxes or other ways, for a better health system, for a better public health system, for a better housing system, that has to be the way forward, uh, and also better better leadership and integration uh, across not just health and health and care, but around regeneration, around planning, around development, in terms of having having healthy cities, healthy environments. It's no coincidence that the highest rates of COVID uh, in terms of uh, impact as well as deaths has been in built up areas where there's been, which is a, with a correlation of lots of people, a lot of young people, a lot of people from black and Asian lots of communities been affected by that. We need to have a better Britain for us to feel if we want to move away from this again for, and have a better life, quality of life as well, and accountability. What's been quite clear also is about accountability from NHS level, from central government level, and from community level uh, as well. So these it raises big issues around democracy, health, and well-being. You you raise that point about building a better Britain, and it brings me on to the question of: Have we seen any signs? Have you seen any signs over the last year uh, that give you hope for the future? Things that um, are lessons that should be learnt from the pandemic that should be taken away and could be used to help build that better Britain. Patrick, if maybe I could come back to you briefly on on that. Is there anything that gives you a sense of hope from over the last year? Oh, well, yeah, I think one of the positives has been acts of kindness uh, in neighbourhoods, local communities, where people have volunteered their time, their resources and money not just simply around creation of mutual aid societies, people have started to look out for each other, which is really positive. And we can build on that spirit of local co-creation, local um, initiative, people looking out for each other. We can build on that, and I think that's quite important. I mean, I mean I've been working with a whole range of individuals and the public raising money, uh, the majority fund that we are launching today, where people can make donations and, and the money will be used to fund and support BME families to organise their own memorials as around that. And that's been the result of thousands of people making £5 donations and above. There have been lots of fundraising. I mean, the late Sir Tom, uh, who raised over £30 million for the NHS, basically, which who dispelled the myth of what older people can or can't do. There's lots of, so we can build an acts of kindness, but that only will work if there's proper support structures and recognition and validation of people in volunteering and, and community uh, organising. So we've seen those kind of acts of kindness, those acts of community um, giving, um, but we need the support framework behind it. Um, Carol, can I um, c- come to you with that question? What, what's given you hope over the last year that we can build that better Britain for the future? I think similarly to Patrick is that the um, crisis, the pandemic seems to have triggered a, a deeper sense of humanity in many people. And from an individual perspective, I think that um, more people have been moved uh, to do and to speak and to be heard in this space 
um, to protest for things. Um, when Black Lives Matter protests started, um, I was heartened to see people of all races and ages um, come onto the streets and, and say, actually, this is not good enough, we need better. Um, I think that is heartening and it gives us an element of hope. I think that is not enough. I think more needs to be done, more can be done. I don't think that we can leave this space if we're really talking about transforming societies um, and, and, and lessening that inequality gap without talking about race equity. We talk about inclusion and diversity, but what's needed in a, the race space is actually equity. It is about a society, a broken society, that needs truth and reconciliation. But we can't have truth and reconciliation unless we have justice. And so we're talking about justice in its broadest terms. Um, we're talking about emotional justice. We're talking about um, societal justice. We're talking about justice in its widest terms. And so we can't move towards that space where we sit and talk and recognize and own our history and start then to reimagine a future where everybody has an equitable um, part to play, an opportunity without addressing uh, some of these uh, very torturous parts of our society that we airbrush over. Um, so I think truth, reconciliation and justice, I think, are important parameters that we need to lay down as we move forward. Thanks, Carol. And this brings us to um, uh, perhaps, our, uh, perhaps uh, the heart of the questions, which is what needs to happen next? What do we need to do? What's the first step towards um, uh, challenging uh, race and equity? Um, Carol, maybe I could come back to you on that. What, what, if, if there was one or two things that you'd like to see happen from key decision makers, what would you like to see those things be uh, over the next year? Well, right at the start of the pandemic, I was aware of a number of BME people that were dying at an alarming rate. Um, I tried to get data. Nobody had any data. I contacted Public Health England. They had no data. There was no data being collected. And so it was very difficult to then to begin to quantify the impact at those very early stages. I also sit on the National Suicide Prevention Strategic Group, and we don't have data. We actually don't know how many BME people commit suicide um, every year because we don't have the data. Um, for some reason, um, from a public perspective, um, somebody or a group decided that it was no longer necessary to collect ethnicity data. We now are in a position where uh, ethnicity will be collected on death certificates and we are working with ONS to begin to establish a baseline for this. But Having no number um, not being recognised in the data means that, again, you are invisible at a very fundamental level. So data has to be um, a key part of the way we address this going forward. Um, I think the other thing is representation in terms of leadership positions. Um, I think there are some very notional tokenistic gestures being made in terms of um, offering BME people positions within organizations that may have some semblance of influence. There is still strong resistance uh, for BME people being positioned by virtue of their talent at senior levels of organization. And I say this because in the past, people may have thought that this was just about mixing up the color on boards. Clearly, what the last year has taught us that is that the system, the leadership, the boards, that govern our public sector have a massive deficiency and incompetency. They are not capable of, of they do not currently have the, the bandwidth on BME communities, experiences, impact. Um, they're not culturally competent, they're not culturally intelligent. So do we move forward from this point without recognizing that in the day, in the time that we're living in, in the diverse societies in which we exist, Cultural intelligence, cultural competency is a key part of leadership, not an add-on, but a core part of leadership. And anybody, regardless of 
um, colour or background that is occupying a position of leadership in the public sector should be able to have the narrative and the understanding and the expertise around matters like biological weathering, around um, matters like uh, race trauma, et cetera, et cetera. And that needs to be inbuilt into the decision making, into the policy frameworks, into the reporting, um, into the accountability of everything that we do. We now want to be in the mainframe. We want to be in the, the, the bloodstream of the public sector and not just highlighted at times of massive crisis when um, we have pandemics or, or such like. Carol, thank you so much. And Vic, maybe I could come to you with the same question. If there was two calls that you could make to key decision makers across the UK, what would those be? What would you like to see happen over the next year? Um, so I think uh, I, I'm really worried about um, what we do with people's grief. I think um, I, I, I think that we're sort of here today, and it's really important we're having this this day. But there, there's a huge amount of um, grief, and 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 I think will be anger about how we've got to this position and I hear what you say Patrick we've done what we can uh, but I think there'll be lots of people who feel there's an awful lot more that could have been done and and things that could have been done very differently and and I suppose I think if we're going to build a better Britain or need a better Britain or you know move ourselves forward in that way we have to really find a way of enabling people to do something with that with that anger we have to find a way of hearing that anger and we have to find a way of making change that is meaningful and, and linked to that and and i suppose that's my it's not really it's not really answering your question sam in terms of what would i want to happen i suppose it's what i don't want to happen which is that that gets silenced and sort of put to one side and we get told that that's that was then and this is now and we've all got to, and now we're all in this together which is about you know creating a new a new normal and and i and i suppose the bit the other bit i guess which i was thinking about when patrick was speaking is you know our our world all of our worlds in many in in have become very much smaller and i think whilst we have whilst that's happened we haven't noticed that because of the because of brexit and other things our our world as in our engagement with the rest of the world has also got smaller and, and I think we absolutely need those alliances, international global alliances. They're part of what what will be um, necessary to to continue to learn, to continue to reshape and continue to support and challenge all sorts of group, different groups' rights. And and I'm very uh, I'm fearful that we we sort of come out of this much smaller um in our reach and uh, not reach in our understanding um and therefore that you know so i suppose two things i think we need to make sure that we continue to have open and engaged and good communication and learning from across the world and also that we find a way to to enable people to do something that they that will help them with that anger and grief um, and, not, and not further discriminate against groups of people by putting that, asking them to put that in a box and say that was then and now, now we've got to move forward. Because I think it's, you know, we haven't all, you know, Marie Curie and others know much better than I do about how to manage grief, but it, it's, it's not possible to put it to one side and we shouldn't be asking people to do that. Thank you, Vic. So we've heard about um, need, the need for improved data, improved representation, uh, better support for people affected by uh, grief and bereavement, and building our international relationships after something which has been a truly global pandemic. Um, uh, Patrick, perhaps I could come to you with the same question. What would you like to see happen over the next year to tackle health and social care inequity? Yeah, I think there's several things we can do. Uh, before we go into the health and social care side, uh, building the points of how do we deal with grief and loss. Uh, I've lost a family member. 
Um, I'm sure people on this on listening to this debate have lost family members or colleagues. Uh, we need to have an independent of inquiry. We need to have inquiry to explore the why did as a country, the fifth richest country in the world, have the highest level of deaths connected with the pandemic. Lots of families, lots of NHS workers, care workers, and why society need to know this. That will help us to move forward, uh, as opposed to anything kicked into the long grass. So that's the first thing. In the context of health and care, um, what's quite clear that frontline workers work in the NHS, in a whole range of job careers and occupations, frontline workers in the care sector, frontline workers in transport, retail, uh, and even all the things that we take for granted. Going to see barbers, your hair salon, you know, frontline workers are, we realize how important they are. A lot of those frontline workers are also migrant workers, and they're not being given the kind of same level of rights other workers because of their immigration status. I think it's about ensuring that frontline workers are always valued and respected as key workers and not just marginal workers. So this is really important in the health and social care world. I think thirdly, um, bring back health action zones. I would say that I used to be a director of one. Health action, we need to have a, a, a whole country having areas where we target and drill down on those key priorities around tackling health inequalities and linking up with and make communities play a key role working in partnership with the NHS, local government, and developers and planners for better neighbourhoods and better areas to tackle some of these big key issues around health and regeneration, which I think is really, really important. Um, I know that public health England's coming to an end, which is a pity. Um, some people might not think so, but we need to have a public health focus. I know that the government wants to talk about health protection, and we always will have health protection because there may be future pandemics, but we need to have a big engine around public health, around well-being, around physical activity. This is really, really important. And, and I think massive investment in mental health, not just purely around NHS mental health services, but having culturally relevant services. Carol talked about trauma, community trauma. As, a, as one thing that's happened around this pandemic, everyone's been traumatised because of the ferocity, the impact of COVID-19. And we don't deal with community trauma in Britain compared yeah. to other countries. We need to have a focus on community trauma. I think organisations like Marie Curie, a whole range of organisations should be having lobbying the government to focus not just simply on individual trauma, but how communities and, and people uh, covered under the Equalities Act in terms of protected characteristics, whether you're black, LGBT, a woman, or of a certain age, should be protected and have access to community trauma support. So that's just my shopping list. Um, there's many more things I can add. Thanks, Patrick. That's a great shopping list. I, I, I'd like to come to a couple of questions uh, in the final 15 minutes that we've had uh, had come in uh, through reflections on the discussion. Um, what, what one listener said, hearing these inequalities, it's hard to believe that there's an Equality Act. It's just not good enough. Uh, Carol, I, I wondered if you could reflect on to what degree has the Equality Act been important and why hasn't it been enough? I think it's people can be very transactional about this and, and, and the way the Equality Act articulates inequality and frames it around the protected characteristics um, enables people to think that that's the beginning and end of equality. And in some ways, I think people have not taken a personal or organisational responsibility for seeking out inequality and addressing it in a systematic way because they are focused on the protected characteristics as if they inequality only exists in that zone. And there is also an illiteracy around equality. Um, so you can write any, any act that you like. If there's a general um, illiteracy, around the subject matter or there is an organisation or professional literacy around it, then people don't understand it. Um, and I think there needs, there's a cognitive dissonance around equality that I think needs to be addressed, particularly in organisations. I think the, one of the things that the uh, pandemic has caused is the uh, NHS and the government 
sort of reawakening inequalities in a very rapid way and giving lots of people responsibility um, in STPs, in, in regions and in organisations around inequality. Well, giving people responsibility without equipping them with the knowledge and expertise to carry out those um, duties is not going to lead to change. So what we have is a lot of people who are uh, enthusiastic amateurs um, trying to think about what's going to create change. And I take Vic's point earlier on about actually we don't want to go backwards. But if we have a fresh set of people in this space who are totally unfamiliar with the issue of inequalities, what's likely to work when, where, how and why, then that's exactly what we're having. We're having some very um, embryonic conversations in very powerful spaces about what needs to happen next. And it's not being informed by um, data and evidence. It's not being informed by um, expertise because over the last uh, couple of decades, I think expertise in the public sector has been repositioned at a very low level. And what we have at a very senior level is um, programme-driven activity, um, which doesn't always have the, um, the expertise position to influence that. So I think there needs to be a massive uh, reframing, restructuring of the way that we address um, this issue if we're going to um, get to change. Thank you, Carol. Um, a further question reflecting on um, your comments earlier, Patrick, about um, the importance of uh, mental health provision uh, through and beyond the pandemic. Um, somebody said, as someone with a severe mental health condition, I've noticed that for myself at least, it has had a huge mental, uh, mental toll on me. And I knew at least one old school friend that committed suicide back in September 2020. Do you honestly believe, hand on heart, that our government will provide more mental health services, especially uh, for the LGBTQ plus community and for people of colour? Uh, Patrick, do you have any reflections on how much hope is there for the future for mental health provision? So, uh, you know, I'm a campaigner. So if we want this, we have to kind of campaign for it. Uh, you know, but the last coalition government, they had what was known as parity of esteem, where physical health and mental health would be treated on the same status, around funding, support, uh, and, uh, and action. And even though there has been some improvements in mental health services, I've sat on the board of two mental health trusts, I uh, currently sit on the board of a mental health trust in Hertfordshire, and, they've, and they're, the, they're one of the best performing mental health trusts in the country. But even they are still struggling because what's happened as a result of the pandemic more and more, there are, there's been more and more incidents, uh, and, and a lot of mental health trusts have recorded this. More and more people have been sent to the mental health trusts. More and more people are in crisis, especially with severe mental health problems. Um, and this begs the question of proper investment. If we as a nation can literally, in the space of months, spend trillions of pounds on furloughing, giving businesses to loans, and a whole range of contracts given around PPE and also as well as investing in vaccines with that energy, why can't we do the same for mental health services, which have been languishing for far too long, for too many decades, and it does not reflect the inequalities. And building on the point that Carol was talking about and from the previous questioner, one of the reasons why LGBT is not taken seriously, as well as issues around race quality being in communities, is not taken seriously, is that um, the NHS has not acknowledged the structure of racism, the structure of homophobia, and therefore, once you acknowledge that, then you can move forward. You know, you can have all the targets you can in the world and all the pledges you can have in the world, but it's about acknowledging that there, there are some issues which will require real long-term thinking and planning and co-production where LGBT people, people of colour are involved in that decision-making process and, and there's clear accountability and scrutiny. Without that, nothing will happen. It's unfortunate that the race the equality legislation has been watered down for by last, by, over the last decade or so. All the powers that have been stripped by the Equality Human Rights Commission, and it's only because of Black Lives Matter everyone's talking about issues around race equality. If, why do you have to take an African-American male murdered in Minneapolis for NHS organisations and local government and the public sector and private sector to say that we want to talk about race? We've had similar situations here in the UK happen under our noses, but we've not done the action. 
And so we have to campaign to make sure there's, there's justice and action and proper equity if we want the right steps that we need for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick. And perhaps a final question, um, a final question if we've got time. Um, one one, one, one uh, listener commented that, um, that, that, that we've talked a lot about um, change at a systemic level, um, but we're interested in, um, said, I think everyone has a responsibility to learn and grow and understand more about health and social care inequalities. What more can one do on the ground? What, what more can uh, people who aren't in uh, po positions where they're able to make policy decisions, what can they do uh, to challenge uh, some of these issues of inequality? Um, Vic, do you have any reflections on this? Yeah, well, I think I would argue that everybody's in a position to make changes at a policy level, in a sense, because we do, you know, we do operate in a, a highly politicised, policy is a highly politicised uh, set of actions, and, and everybody has access to their local MPs and, and, and local government. And, and I think that, you know, Patrick's right in the sense as a campaigner, we all need to think about ourselves as campaigners around this, because we, we just come out of if we have come out of it, but, you know, a period of austerity, and we're about to be flung back into a period of austerity at, at the end of this, when we have to think about how we cope with the 400 billion or, or, or more that's been spent on COVID. So, you know, actually, if we want to make sure that mental health services, if we want to make sure that, the, the, that all the things we're talking about are changed, improved, enhanced, and we come out better, then we're going to have to fight pretty hard for those things to remain important and to remain high on policymakers' agenda. So I think that there's something that we can all do around that. And I, and I think in terms of uh, personal actions, I, I suppose that, you know, what one of the things that we have found, I, I think and it was mentioned early on by Carol, is the kind of, you know, the kind, the pockets of kindness, the sort of things that people have been able to do have, have been really really important i mean you know obviously we're talking a lot with people who are receiving care and support but also their unpaid carers and others who've been you know often very overwhelmed by the support that local people local communities have been able to offer and and i think we've kind of unleashed a bit of permission to both ask for help and to, and to offer help and that that not be seen as a thing of weakness so or intrusion so you know i think we could all keep the doors open around that um figuratively and maybe at, at some point uh down the line actually really be able to open our doors and and do things for other people so um i think that would be my thoughts thank you vic i i, I love that idea that we're all policy makers and uh, the uh the, the, the Carol, you reflected earlier on the importance of community action through the course of the pandemic as being something that has actually been quite uplifting, quite, uh, quite hopeful, gives you hope for the future. I wonder if you've got any uh, reflections on do, how can we keep that going into the future? Should we be trying to keep that going into the future? Uh, what more support might be needed in order to do so? I think um, we need to um, understand, you know, ask ourselves the questions, whose world is it? And it, it's all of our worlds, you know? And so we all have at some level ability to influence in all kinds of ways. We live in a democracy so we can make use of our influence um, to lobby, as um, Patrick has said, um, both locally and nationally in terms of keeping these things on the agenda and trying to drive change. But at a very basic level, um, there was a song that we used to sing when I was at school was when I needed a neighbour where you're there. Um, and I think we all have the ability to love beyond the containment of our own four walls and and take time to consider how other people are being impacted on by the pandemic around us and be more um, sensitive and aware and be willing to go beyond our comfort zones and our little units and, and reach out. Um, and support others. Um, I think cultural competence, again, is really about having a strong awareness of ourself and our own culture and the impact it has on other people around us. I think there is a, a huge mental health crisis on an individual level, a collective level, but the mental health um, system 
is also in crisis. And I think we have no other alternative but to take some of these controls, take some of this opportunity into our hands and begin to um, support our own mental health and well-being, support the mental health and well-being of those around us. So there's an opportunity to love in all kinds of ways, to support in all kinds of ways, to share in all kinds of ways. And I would love to see a resurgence of, of love in society as a result of this. Thanks, Carol. That's so great to hear. And Patrick, I wonder if there's anything at a community level that you'd like to see happen that you don't think is happening at the moment? Anything new that you think should you, you think that there's a gap for that, that, that you'd like to see started up? I, I think there's been lots of stuff on a positive level. I mean, you've got people doing stuff in their communities. And what we've noticed, the work that we've done at Centre Aging Better, all ages are doing volunteering, community action, community participation, and doing stuff in our community, whether they're young people or older people. What we need to do is more stuff around intergenerational conversations. I think that's really important. Yes, conversations about race and discrimination, that's important, but also conversations around intergenerational stuff. Prior to the pandemic, there was this whole dichotomy that the baby boomers had taken all the wealth out of Britain and there was now the Y generations left with nothing at all, which unfortunately that has been further reinforced to such extent by the impact of the pandemic. But we need to talk about different ages coming together. You know, you know, I mean, when I grew up um, um, with my parents, uh, you know, the, there was like that, that African proverb, it took a village to raise a child. I think the village got, I think the motorway, a brand new motorway was built between the village. So the village didn't really happen anymore. We need to get rid of the motorway, bring the village back together again and start talking and working together. That's what we need to do. And I think the panic's doing that. But it's only going to work if there's proper support and leadership at local level, local government level, and at national level. And it's, and it's about messaging and role modelling. It's really critical. If people, if you don't give the role modelling, then people need hope and aspiration. And being a Trekkie, we have to live along and be prosper. Well... <laughs> I can't think of a better way to end this session, but um, we've heard so much from all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vic, Carol, Patrick, uh, for talking about the deep um, systemic challenges that have led to health and social care inequities through the course of the pandemic, issues of racism and um, discrimination, which have been um, built to a furious, a frenetic um, level of um, harm as a result of the pandemic pandemic but have always been there and it's been great to hear some of the solutions that you've talked about the need for new public health approaches the need for better data for better representation um, it's been so inspiring um, to have the opportunity to talk to you all about challenging health and social care uh, um, health and social care inequity uh, both now and into the future and uh, I hope we can take away some of the lessons from today uh, and use them to um, uh, to help make the case for change uh, and build, build build back better build a better Britain uh, into the future as we as we've been talking about but it just remains for me to say thank you so much Carol thank you so much Vic and Patrick uh, for your time this afternoon uh, and for talking uh, talking as part of this uh, this National Day of Reflection event about um, about tackling uh, health and social care inequity in the UK uh, thank you <laughs>